So I want to uh, welcome everybody for uh, this evening, uh, evening session on uh, how to publish. Um, we're really excited that uh, so many people decided to join us this evening. Uh, hopefully we'll f you'll all find this is a worthwhile, uh, I guess, divergence before you go out for dinner. Look at it as an appetizer, I guess. Um, my name is Rich Vaya. Uh, I'm from the Air Force, U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory in Dayton, Ohio. I'm also chair of uh, MRS Publications. Uh, and uh, with our publication partner, Cambridge, we're really excited to uh, pull together this program and, and talk to you guys uh, about how to publish and, and what are some of the ways to publish and some of the considerations uh, to, get, uh, to get your work published into the right community. So before we begin, I just want to get a feel for who's all in the audience. So if, if you would mind, maybe just raise your hand. Uh, how many people here are graduate students? Oh, awesome. Perfect. Uh, how about uh, postdocs? Okay. Young researchers, young professionals? Awesome. And those who have not raised their hand, I know where you're at, similar to the rest of us, so I'm not going to ask. Because uh, we don't want to talk about how old we are getting. So uh, this is exactly the type of, of audience we wanted to communicate to uh, and try to give you guys uh, sort of some perspectives from editors uh, of journals, what are the key things they're looking for uh, when they're seeing uh, work come in. Uh, so what the structure is going to be is we're going to ask the editors to give a little bit of their thoughts on, on different formats of journals uh, and journal articles. Uh, and then we'll have a panel discussion to sort of engage you guys so you have the opportunities to ask the editor specific questions uh, about, uh, about things. So sounds good? So um, I already introduced myself, talked a little bit about the purpose uh, of the session. Um, I just a couple, I guess, general announcements. Um, so uh, we're recording this session, so I want to make sure everybody is aware that um, questions, dialogue, everything is being captured on video, and we're planning to post this for MRS On Demand. So if there's anything that's, that is said and discussed during this time, uh, don't, don't forget there'll be uh, uh, access to that uh, up on the MRS uh, website. But most importantly, uh, just so you know, uh, you'll be recorded if, if you ask a question. Um, there's also handouts and literature. If, if anybody's interested, when you leave in the back, there's a table there. Uh, talks a little bit about some of the MRS publications, some of the aspects of, of MRS publications, and also uh, just encourage you and remind you that uh, Cambridge and uh, other publishers have their booths up in the exhibit hall, and MRS Publications also has a booth outside the exhibit hall. So we encourage you to stop by and, and, and talk to the people there and carry on dialogue uh, afterwards. And I talked a little bit about the session flow. So uh, why don't we begin? What I'd like to do is uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, so uh, over here on your right, my left, uh, Gary Messing, uh, he's a professor at Penn State, and he's the editor of uh, JMR. Anything else you want to? Uh, okay. Uh, next to next to Gary is uh, Peter Green. Peter's from the University of Michigan, uh, and he's editor of our MRS Communications. Uh, and then uh, Dave Ginley is from the uh, DOE's uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And he's editor-in-chief of our newest journal, uh, Energy and uh, Sustainability, that actually their first issue is out this week. And if uh, people want to see uh, the, the initial inaugural um, articles, uh, they're available uh, upstairs. So we're very excited to, to have the editors here today. And, and uh, MRS Publications has really, over the last couple years, uh, have made uh, a, uh, a, a strong effort to grow and expand our offerings. Uh, journal uh, JMR has been on a, a rapid uh, growth uh, in its offerings, um, special issues that people may be interested in, uh, as well as the, uh, the impact factor has uh, continually improved uh, over the last few years. Uh, MRC has is, is also been around for a couple years. It's also been continuing to grow uh, in prominence and uh, its impact, uh, and also has introduced 
uh, novel forms like perspectives, and Peter will talk a little bit of some of that. And uh, Dave will, uh, materials and sustainability is again another new type of offering for the community. It's a review journal, but a review journal that really focuses on interdisciplinary. And energy and sustainability is the epitome of interdisciplinary fields. And so it's these types of offerings that uh, MRS Publications with Cambridge is really trying to pull together uh, and move forward. Um, and so with that as sort of the introduction, uh, like I said, um, how we're going to structure the, uh, the, the session is we'll hear some short remarks from the panelists and then probably most importantly and exactly what hopefully all you hear is for, is for the dialogue uh, back and forth. So before I begin, everybody, any questions? All right, cool, so let's get going. So the first thing we want to talk a little bit about is selecting the right journal. Um, we all are active and excited about the research that we do uh, and the ideas that we have, and the reason we want to publish is to communicate those ideas and those findings and those perspectives to our colleagues, uh, both immediate colleagues and, and, and the broader community. And the first thing we need to figure out before we decide what we're going to write or the format we're going to write is what, what journal we're going to go to or what type of, of journal uh, we're going to go, uh, go after. And so um, let me just give a couple of comments on that before we go over to the, uh, the panelists. So selecting the right journal. Really, in essence, when, when you think about what journal you're going to publish your findings in, it's really about knowing the audience, choosing the audience. It's not so much about what you have. It's thinking about who needs to know what you have, so choosing the audience. And so this is a, a series of questions that uh, uh, I myself go through uh, when I choose where we're going to publish work for my group, and I know many of my colleagues do also. So the first thing we look at is we need to answer, we answer, try to answer the question, what are we trying to say to whom? There's a lot of different things to say. Sometimes we want to develop techniques or data that we want to tell our immediate peers. Uh, other times we have new ideas and some initial, uh, initial demonstration of those ideas that we want to get to a broader community. Uh, other times we want to synthesize what's been done before to provide a platform for the community so that we can help drive or help form where future directions are going. And other times we may have just stumbled across or come across really exciting, innovative ideas or findings that not only impact our immediate community, the community surrounds that, but the broader materials research community or even beyond the materials research community, people who use materials. So it's really trying to understand what you have uh, and what your audience interests are and knowing the limitations of those. And that really then leads to understanding the context of the work. Um, you need to first know the audience's language. If you're talking to your peers, there's certain terminology you use. But if you're trying to talk to the broader community, you need to understand what those other auxiliary communities or those multidisciplinary communities uh, also know and how they communicate. And bringing that language back and understanding which journals they go to is this, and what types of formats they like to uh, understand or consume their information from is, is critically important. And then the last thing, both of those lead to the correct article format. First and foremost, you're trying to impact your community, so you need to know the context and what your audience needs. It's great that if I have new data that the audience needs to form future models for predicting materials behavior, but if I don't provide that data with the right format in the right audience, I might, not have, I might as well not even have published it. So I need to understand what that audience needs. And I also need to understand the weaknesses and the strengths of what I have. And this is a cycle of questions that we go through all the time in trying to hone. And at the end of the day, not everything we do uh, is something that we're going to go to science and nature for. Um, at the end of the day, what we want to do is target the audience with the right target the audience with the right format that's appropriate for what we're trying to say. And that's what this whole idea of selecting the right journal is about. Well, I have a question. So can you elaborate a little more on knowing your weaknesses and strengths and what exactly do you mean by that context of publishing? So knowing the weaknesses and the strengths of the data that you have. 
or all of the concepts that you have in context to what the rest of the community has. Uh, there are certain communities that require uh, five, six, seven times uh, re re reproducibility of results. There's other communities that the experiments are so difficult, it's a one or two observation that's necessary. That's just one example of really understanding what I mean by weaknesses and strengths. What is it that you have that is unique and strong? What is it that you may be lacking relative to what the community wants? So hopefully that sort of gives you a context of how to think about choosing the journal uh, or choosing the format. And at the end of the day, it's really about targeted communication because we all want to maximize the impact of what we're doing. And so we do a lot of things, a lot of different audiences. We just need to take into consideration what that audience is so we can tailor how we're communicating to them in the right way. So that's really what I just wanted to say about selecting the right journal. Um, now let me turn it over to each of the panelists to talk a little bit about um, uh, how to create a successful journal article after you've sort of thought about where to publish and what format you want to publish in. So before I turn it over, I've just been handed a note. There's a lot of people standing in the back. Um, I know it's Sunday, but we do have opening seats in the front, so please come forward. Plenty of seats. Uh, and for those that just walked in, I just want to remind everybody we are recording this, so um, uh, questions and dialogue is all going to be recorded, but please feel free to come up and sit down. So first I want to turn it over to Gary. Uh, he'll talk a little bit about uh, JMR and their offerings and sort of what it means to publish in JMR. Thank you very much, Rich. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's really great to see such a large outpouring for a Sunday evening before the big meeting. What I wanted to do is maybe clue you in on a few things to think about as you're going uh, out there with your first publication or your second or third. It takes a while to learn how to do this business right. Uh, so I'm using uh, the JMR scope of uh, what we publish in the journal. When you go for a journal, go look at this first. Find out that's whether your topic actually fits that journal. Does it fit it well? If your topic doesn't fit it well, go look for another journal. Okay, these days you can Google, so you can just put in a topic and find out which journals even cover it. Uh, so, uh, when you think about that, but read it carefully because sometimes you'll find out as you run down through what's in it, you'll find that, yeah, some, yeah, these are things that I do. I do things like interfaces. I do core material science. I do computation. And then all of a sudden you find out that your paper is about asphalt. And there's a little line at the bottom, we don't want papers about asphalt or natural materials. Ah, that's <coughs> fine, no problem. Go find a journal that does cover that. Okay, so make sure you read all the way to the bottom of it. Otherwise, you're going to waste your time. You're going to waste your time in messaging your paper to find out that it gets reviewed within two days. Okay, so think about that when you first go out looking for a journal. Uh, the kind of journal articles, full-length papers. So JMR publishes full-length papers. You're going to hear about communications. You're going to hear about uh, other types of publications later. A full-length article is 6,000 words. 8,000 words in some journals. You can go that many. Uh, always count on you're going to have a number of figures. Those figures count nominally about 250 words a figure. Subtract that from the number of 6,000 or 8,000. Okay, so they count as much. But don't go to the extreme. Don't submit a paper with 20 figures thinking, I've got it and all I have to do is write 2,000 words. You will be rejected. Okay, and some people, okay, English isn't your native language and it's hard to write all the words, but I've got 20 or 25 great figures. Don't do that, okay? Work through writing the article, the length of it. Keep the figure number down 10, 12 figures at the most. Okay, really be critical about your work. When you write your paper, really emphasize what's your contribution to the discipline you're writing about. Benchmark yourself against the best papers out there. If you don't know what that is, then you've made a big mistake because that means you haven't actually figured out that here are the three best areas, uh, topics, uh, excuse me, papers, and this is where my field is. And I, what I've got to do is I've got to jump up to make a big contribution. So think hard about emphasizing what that contribution is 
Be quantitative about your contribution. Don't write in general terms. Don't say I made a large advance, I made a higher value. Be specific. Did you really have a higher value? Is it, is, is it 5% increase? 5% isn't going to get you published in a lot of journals today. They'll just reject you out of hand. You will not get reviews. Okay? Avoid reporting really small incremental changes. Again, all the journals are being inundated with papers and they'll tell you, look at your paper and go, small increment, don't want your paper, submit it to somebody else. And they'll give you a journal uh, that, they, will, they, they won't accept it either, but they're letting somebody else have a chance at your paper and maybe they will take it, okay? But always think about big impact, what is it, but you have to tell the reader what that is. The review articles, a lot of people like to do review articles, they're very impactful. Dave's going to talk to you about that later. But do a critical assessment of the literature. That introduction that you may have written at the front end of your thesis where you said what paper one did, paper two did, paper three, paper N plus 100 has done, that's not a critical review. Don't just list a bunch of things that people did. You know, what's the essence of your field? Okay. That's a critical review. What's the, what's the important outcomes? Where's that field going? And so you're going to hear about perspectives later on today. Um, when you do a review article, check journal guidelines. Most journals that do review articles want you first to ask because they'll tell you that your review isn't in the right area. They'll ask you for an outline in some cases. But ask first. Don't just send in a whole review article and say, I got a 30-page paper for you. And they're going to say, sorry, you missed. You know, and if you'd asked, you probably could have been guided on what would have been a good paper. Uh, invited feature papers. So in the journal, we do something special called invited feature papers. We invite people, often from these meetings here, uh, we invite people to come and write papers to us uh, and submit papers. Uh, we highlight them in the journal. Uh, and what we're lo looking for are papers that are really at the cutting edge. And that's why authors at this meeting, the San Francisco meeting, the Cancun meeting, those are people that we invite oftentimes. Uh, not everybody, but some people are invited to write articles. Make your paper impactful. You have to remember there are two things that are freely published about your paper. The title and the abstract. Okay? If your library doesn't have that whole journal, People aren't going to see it. So there's two things that are going to advertise. The first one is the title. In your title, don't write some general thing like the effects of X, Y, Z on the A, B, C, and that's it. No, be specific. Enhance thermoelectric power uh, properties and X, Y, Z. Be specific if it's a material-specific paper. Or if you happen to have discovered something that was really cool, that you discovered that nano layering was really, really cool, and you got incredible properties in thermoelectrics. By the way, that, that, that area has been taken already, so, <laughs> so don't rush out and start working on this. Nano layered thermodynamics, wow. No material being mentioned. People are going to go, everybody who's in thermoelectrics is going, to, wow, I want to go see this paper. And you'll get all kinds of attention with the right title. So think a lot about the title of that paper before you do it. Once people read it, remember, we're all getting emails these days of table of contents of journals. People peruse them really quickly, and they're just looking. What, what, uh, oh, wait, what's this? This is cool. So think about that. That's the first entree that you have for somebody to look at your paper. The second one is the abstract. Write a good abstract. Spend time at it. Don't write some general thing. We made better X, Y, Z. And, you know, and by the way, we, we used 15 different quantities. Uh, characterization tools. Don't write the list of characterization tools. Don't put that in the abstract. Who cares? Of course you're using characterization tools. We expect that. So, but many times we see in abstracts a list of characters. Be specific. If you did FTIR, tell what the specific thing that you learned from FTIR was. We used FTIR to learn about this. And oh, the readers are going, cool. Remember, in 100 words or maybe 150 words, people are going to assess your paper. So spend time writing a good abstract. It's, it's your advertisement to the field, okay? In your abstract, don't write part of the introduction in it. Don't, don't tell us about the introduction. We're, we, we, we're looking at your title already. We, we're interested. We, we want thermoelectrics. We already know thermoelectrics, so we don't need the introduction now. So don't waste your words on introductory stuff. 
What are the key outcomes? What are the key results? Remember, you want to encourage people to come and look at your paper, to explore your paper. Kind of a special gripe of mine is people don't spend time working on their figures either. Sometimes they put in a whole bunch of figures, the one the set, sequence on the left. You can hardly differentiate anything in those figures. Yeah, they, they, they could, but when you look at them, and you can't see it. You can't see anything. It wasn't really presented very well. The one on the right, same authors, by the way, yeah, they got lots of detail in there. They're pointing at details. They've got some indexing going on. That's a nice figure. They've taken time. The other one was the one that they should have just put, put in the appendix, a supplemental material if you really think it's that important, or don't publish it. It's not necessary to publish, publish everything you did. All right? A final comment then. Integrity is always first and foremost when we publish. Okay? You got to be honest. Okay? And, you know, one of the things that we find in the literature is eh, people just get lazy. You know, they, they, they take a couple of paragraphs out of somebody else's paper, or they'll take a figure and forget to acknowledge that it's somebody else's figure and not yours. Okay, so the, the comment here, I think, is a particularly important one. There is no variation on the theme of integrity. Integrity means the same thing all over the world. There's no special new definitions as we go from you know, Florida to Pennsylvania to Germany to Taiwan to Korea to Colombia. It's all the same, OK? Scientific misconduct, when you falsify results, every once in a while it happens. Uh, always it's huge news. You see the articles in Science and Nature when somebody falsifies data. Famous scientists do it sometimes. And oh my gosh. Their reputation is ruined for the rest of their life. You do not want to be in that situation. You're at the beginning of your career. And if you at any time get, get marked as having, you know, maybe didn't use your data the right way, or you got rid of some data points that, yeah, they're not that important. Uh, OK, well, they were important. Or you elevated a few data points to make it look better. No, don't do that. OK, you'll get caught. Okay, you'll get caught at plagiarism. You'd be amazed at how many people read your paper. When it gets in the literature, hundreds of people will look at your paper and they will recognize what is in your paper was something they read in the paper six months ago. They said, I've seen this. I, I, I've done this myself. I've been reading a paper and gone, I've seen this before. And you know, I searched my memory banks and I'll say, I, oh, I know where that is. And I found it. And, I, and it's amazing how many times it happens, but people, know what's in the literature. So don't take the easy way out. Work hard. Be, be ethical. Be honest with your readership. If you do that, you'll be great. Emphasize the really top quality things you're doing, and you'll be in great stead uh, in your publishing history. And the slope of your career will be like this. So I think with that, I'll now move the, on to Peter. Great. Thank you, Gary. Mm -hmm. um, Peter Green now will talk a little bit about communications. Okay, so good afternoon everyone and again um, welcome. I'm Peter Green, um, Editor-in-Chief of MRS Communications. I want to spend the next few minutes um, giving you some insight into the goals and scope of MRS Communications and, so, and to also give you an idea of the kinds of articles that we publish. MRS Communications um, publishes impactful papers in materials research that are of interest to a general materials audience. So as you write your cover letter, the abstract and the introduction to your paper, it, you need to be able to ask yourself, is this of interest to people outside your specific area of research, and is it of interest to a general audience? Now, the journal, we're interested in um, structured property processing relationships, um, very much in the spirit of the interdisciplinary field of material science and engineering, pretty much. And um, we're interested in theory, simulations, experiments, or papers that cover all of the above, by and large. Now, there are a wide range of topics of interest to MRS communications, and I've just simply just listed, just tried to summarize them here. But it covers all areas of soft and hard matter, in soft matter covering biomaterials and polymers. It covers um, in situ characterization methods, and in fact, um, things like um, properties of materials at a nanoscale. So it's a relatively broad, um, broad area, and pretty much things that you see at an MRS meeting would be of interest to MRS communications, by and large.
There are five types of articles that we publish. Um, the perspectives, and the perspectives I'll say some more in a, in, in a moment, but these are forward-looking short reviews. They're very different from the typical review article that you might find in an archival journal or that which um, you hear about um, in, a, in, a, in a moment or so from Dave. The research letters, and these tend to be short, concise um, publications that really are communicating a relatively novel uh, result. We, like other journals, um, publish editorials, either written by a member of the board or a guest of notable stature. The commentaries that we might at, at times write about a paper that's been published, or indeed, um, perhaps someone may write an editorial about a paper that's been published already and raises a question. So let me now spend a minute or two. Are those, talk pu are those published pages? Are those published pages or are those submitted pages? Page lengths. Or the published. Published pages. Yes, published. Okay. Yeah. The perspectives. So this is a unique feature of MRS communications, right? So it offers an authoritative, balanced, and succinct, very forward-looking review. Uh, it's not a typical review of, um, of a field which typically um, is very, uh, covers far more information and is very historical. It may address the controversies or it may be speculative. So it's short between six to 10 printed pages, published pages, with a maximum of 100 references. Um, illustrations are encouraged. And if you have extra information, you can actually use, use a supplementary section. Now, the perspectives are typically are invited. Or in fact, what we began doing late, you can actually submit a proposal to write a, write a perspective. And the proposal will be reviewed by the editors. And in fact, there, there's one, there are a few that we've received um, recently. I thought it might be useful to give you some idea of perspectives that are there. So here's one. Um, I set up engineering of silicon and diamond for quantum computing and <coughs> sensing applications. And this, really, this article is actually um, written from the point of view of a materials scientist, materials engineer who's actually working in the area. And it's, the work is based on the notion, essentially, that um, quantum computing and um, quantum sensing uh, can be compatible with a solid state platform. If that's true, then it potentially might be integrated into some uh, sort of uh, classical devices. And so this article, if you go to the current issue of MRS communications, is actually open access. You can actually download it. That's another example here involving sort of soft matter, where you're looking at um, nanoparticles that are incorporated within a polymer host. Um, this is very fascinating because this, what it cover, this topic covers some very interesting scientific issues in what is phase equilibrium. At the same time, um, these nanocomposites exhibit properties that are quite phenomenal and not achievable by, um, by, by the polymers themselves. So this is a very exciting area. In fact, um, the author is um, Richard Bayer here. <laughs> so let me go on. The research letter. The research letter, as I mentioned earlier, is really a, a concise presentation of, um, of work. It's about 46 printed pages, it's supposed to be a novel result and fairly impactful. Again, you, look, you ask yourself the question, if you're submitting a letter, um, is this of interest to people outside the area of your particular um, interest? And again, it's the short abstract, 100 years. Gary talked um, quite nicely about what, to, what the abstract should and shouldn't include. And the title is also very important. Make sure that the title is actually quite accurate and doesn't really oversell what it is that you're trying to do. <laughs> Sorry, that's the other side of it. <laughs> yes. And uh, there's a section for supplemental information, if, should that become necessary. So if you have a really novel idea, we'll love to, we'll love to have it. And the editors will look at it very carefully, and the paper is publishable will, will actually help you to make sure that um, it, you can actually, it's actually publishable in some sense, if it's, if it's there, if it's good. So what to accept after your paper is um, accepted? What to expect, rather? So within 14 days, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be published. Um, you can choose an open access option. And um, that one of the perspectives I mentioned just now has an open access option. So you can actually go to the current issue and download it if you like. It won't be there forever, so you should do that. And certainly, uh, you, can, um, you can get to MRS communication through a variety of access options, from a mobile format to iTunes and various Android apps. And so I think with this, I will hand over to Dave, in case you need this. So um, we don't quite fit the mold of the, the typical journal, which wouldn't be any fun for me. So uh, and. As a consequence, we have more than one editor-in-chief. There's actually three of us, and I'm happy to say that at least one more of us has shown up 
So David Cahan in the back, stand up David. From the Weissman Institute is one of the editors in chief as is Sally Benson at Stanford University. And part of the reason for that is we're striving for a diversity that's hard to cover for one editor. And so uh, what our vision was is that this would be provide as a review journal a platform for discussion for the topics of materials for energy and sustainability. And as those of you who are aware, MRS has emphasized both of those topics and in fact, it's hard to define either topic. And especially sustainability is hard to define. And so how do you define the context of sustainability? You do it by putting together articles that are both technical and have to do with that topic, but you also put together articles, sociology, philosophy, and economics. And so we are trying to do that. We actually have about 30 articles stacked up, which are very, very diverse. Um, Cambridge is nervous. We'll see how this goes. Um, we're pretty excited about it. We very much encourage people to submit ideas for new articles. We are obviously very open-minded in terms of the topics and how they fit together. And uh, as you'll see from some of the articles coming out, we do have a very broad range. Um, I thought I would just kind of poke you guys uh, a little bit to, to stimulate the panel discussion that's coming up. And they made me not talk about impact factors, so I won't a lot. And. Um, but I did want to say that if you look at articles, they have very different time constants if you want to talk about the lifetime of the article after publication. And I, I will point out that in, in general, reviews have a much longer half-life if you look at citations. That's not un, unexpected. Letters have a, a much shorter half-life. Full papers tend to have variable half-length. But as Gary will tell you, JMR is kind of an exception to this in that their articles actually have a very long half-life. It tends to be that the community really uses that as an archival resource. Um, there's also sort of, if you look at the time after publication and, and uh, citations in general, and this is years, there's sort of a, uh, a, a, sort of a an increase, so if you publish your article and you expect to have a million citations six months after you publish, it's not going to happen, unless it's a perovskite paper. Um, and really, the, the citations build. I actually have a paper, I hate to say how old I am, that was published in 1975 that is still getting substantial, substantial citations. Um, so I'm way out here in the tail. It's not even on the plot. But in fact, even journals, the impact factor really is a reflection of two to three years of publishing, not the first year of publishing. So um, as a neophyte journal, we don't have an impact factor yet. So we can imagine that it will be really high. Um, but it is something to keep in mind in terms of what your expectations when you publish are. So let's talk about how you put a review article together. And I, and I put some, some bullets here just for you to think about, um, and this is actually not just a review article, many of these are applicable across the board. So read the instructions, and read the instructions for submission really carefully. Um, I don't know how many times people get in trouble, graduate students especially, by sending something in and having it come back and go, what? Um, define the scope of the article you're gonna write. This is really important. Um, and especially, you might want to outline it in detail before you ever even start writing it. Um, I think that co-authors and collaborators are invaluable resources. You want to both mine their knowledge, but you also want to bounce everything off of them critically. Uh, don't dwell on previous review articles. Um, reviewing a review is usually not a productive thing. Think about the white space that hasn't been covered previously. Um, Make your outline and follow it. And when you make an outline, think about how long you're going to be and allocate the pages. And I think that's true of any article. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about that I, is, we all get our pet peeves, of course. Mine is an article tells a story, right? It tells a story of some research that you did 
or some field that you're interested in or some new exciting development that's happening, you want to, like any story, you want to be able to introduce the story, you want to be able to tell the body of the story, and then you want to come back and tell them what the end was. And I don't know why people are so afraid of telling people the answer up front, but one of the things you should have heard as a theme here is tell them the answer up front. Tell them in the abstract. Now, I'm a big proponent of numbers in the abstract. If you have a new solar cell and it's 2% more efficient than the previous solar cell, put it in there and put it that it's a documented efficiency. You'll get readers. You know, tell the story. Tell the, the our whole article should be a story and you should be able to outline it from the beginning. Um, Look at the scientific literature. We all get very frustrated, especially nowadays with the proliferation of journals in actually trying to stay up with the literature. Um, it's hard, and it's especially difficult when you get you know, 700 references for a paper like Peter's that's two pages long. Um, you've got to think about really carefully which ones make a difference to what you're talking about. And so you really need to review the the literature and you need to go over it in the context of what you're writing. Spend some time with all your PDFs and web browsers closed. We all get really, really into having, you know, 50 windows open on our Mac. And, you know, close them for a second and just think about what the articles have told you, what the topic is really about, how you're going to integrate that information into that story that you're going to tell. And it's hard to do when you're actively writing. So I, I guess I'm saying again and again, plan. Uh, don't be shy about defining your role versus your, your collaborators' roles, especially if you have high power collaborators. Um, sometimes they come in at the end and go, what were you thinking? Hold your ground. Read the journal's instructions very carefully, especially, and I think Gary mentioned this, or maybe it was Peter, a lot of journals actually have a proposal. We have a proposal form. You've got to fill out that proposal form, because if you just submit an article, we don't know what to do with it. Um, we'll send you back and say, OK, um, <laughs> write a proposal. Um, it's very useful for a review journal, because review journals are always trying to have a contextual sort of strategy for how they're going to publish. And we want that proposal because that'll help us time phase. It'll also, you know, we might come back to you and say, this is a really great idea, can get it done in a month. Or we might say, we really like your idea, but it'll fit in a journal that's going to come out 12 months from now. Um, get familiar with your software. Um, this is really important. Uh, this can really help, especially if you're, if you're not native English speaking. A lot of tools now can really help you. So there's there's Word and Papers, there's EndNote, there's Adobe Illustrator. It doesn't really matter what you use, but know it and know how it fits together to put your paper together and how it works with the submission process. You don't want to end up with a form that you can't easily submit. Um, we already talked about that. And I think I'm done, so I turn it back over to Rich, and we get to have questions from you guys. Thank you. So I'm just going to... So hopefully what we've been able to do is give everybody, based on the context, starting with what you have in the lab, trying to think about who wants to, to learn about that, and then looking at the variety of options, whether it's an archival journal, what needs to go into that, a short letter or a prospectus uh, or a review, and how to think about pulling those things together. And so that's really the first part of writing the paper. The second part of writing the paper is actually navigating the peer review process. And so before we move on to the navigating the peer review process, which we'll have uh, uh, some, some seated questions to start the discussion with the editors, because at the end of the day, right, it's navigating your paper through these guys. Um, but before we get to that, we want to just open up for questions with regard to um, the types of articles, or how do you choose which type of article to, to frame your work in? Uh, is there any questions along those lines or things that have been talked about up to this point? Yep. 
Yes. Um, I think we have a microphone. We have a mic. Yeah, I apologize. I should have mentioned that before. When you ask a question, please use the mic, and then I'll ask the panel to repeat the question also before you answer it so that it's recorded. Go ahead. Um, so earlier uh, you had uh, mentioned that there are different types of um, options in terms of accessibility for the articles. And so what is the advantage? I mean, when I think about it like open access articles, it seems like, yeah, you know, you're able to download the article regardless of where you are. And so maybe that's helpful in terms of getting more citations. But um, could you elaborate a little bit more on, I guess, what are the sorts of um, considerations one should make in terms of getting, in, in terms of deciding uh, the access. Dave, okay. do you want to start? So that's a really good question. And, uh, Can you repeat the question? The question? Like what are, how do you decide upon the options for what kind of a, a, a publication you're going to have when you decide you know, where or how you're going to submit? So I think the, the answer is partially going to be historically defined. We're running very rapidly toward open access across the board. And there's a lot of reasons why that's the case. Can you define open access for the audience? I don't know that yeah, so, that. Well, even that's complex. Yeah. So thank you, Gary. <laughs> so, so at its simplest, open access means when you publish your paper, it's immediately available online to the community. The reality is that there are different modes of open access depending on each particular journal. Some journals are truly open access like that. Some journals have a time phased open access. Um, one of the things that's driving the process is the fact that many of the funding agencies, at least in the United States, are increasingly of the opinion that research work which they pay for ought to be generally available to the scientific community free of access, free of charge. And so we see a trend driving toward open access. Most of the societies are creating and evolving models for what that open access looks like continuously. In the near term, it may be as simple as a financial decision on how much money you have. Open access right now for some journals actually costs, you have to pay for the open access fee, um, which can be substantial. Um, and you don't if you if you don't have open access, and so that could be a deciding factor. From my own viewpoint, um, I see us rapidly evolving to an open access world, and I think if I can publish open access, I'm highly in favor of that. But uh, that's a personal opinion, not a not a general opinion, and maybe the, right. the, there's I other opinions. The other, the other advantage of open access is that um, there are a vast number of researchers across the globe and other continents that would have access to it immediately. Otherwise, they won't. So it's a way of communicating the work as, as right. broadly as possible and getting as much interest. Gary, you have anything else? Yeah, I, I don't know that you can actually make too many decisions about which journals to submit to today uh, in the materials field because unlike the health-based uh, journals, that are almost all open access now, you can make it a decision based upon that. In materials, there's actually very few that have adopted across the entire platform open access. So I wouldn't think that would be the first place you'd look. You may find out in the process that they would then open up a certain part of it. But I agree with Dave, probably over the next, within the next five years, this will all change. But it won't, won't affect you today, because hopefully all of you will publish something on the order <laughs> of 25 pa papers per person within the next five years. Otherwise, you just won't get tenure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that positive tone and yeah. <laughs> set expectation for everybody, uh, any additional questions with regard to uh, journal type? Okay, one more. Go ahead. There's the mic on its way over. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry I keep asking so many questions. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to um, hear a little bit more about um, the factors that come into play when deciding whether to publish a letter or a full journal article because you can, you know, you can publish a letter and you can have it come out really soon but then in some cases it's nice to actually flesh out the work a little more and so um, under what circumstances 
would it be more preferable to publish a letter versus a full mm -hmm. article? Excellent question. I think that um, this is a very good question. If there's something that is urgent and compelling, then I think a letter is entirely appropriate. If on the other hand, you've spent some, a lot of time doing some work, um, you have a very full story and it's not a urgent, um, it's not, you don't need the urgent to publish before you're gonna get scooped, take the time to write a really good long paper. Because you probably realize the papers that have, that have been of most value to you in graduate school are the papers that you learn a lot from, and those tend to be archival papers. And um, so, so that's, that's my, my sense of it. Yeah, I, I would add that publishing a letter does not exclude you from writing the long, informed paper, the regular journal article. And so you may want to just try to own some property out there. A certain thing that you've actually done that is, like Peter said, it's exciting. Wow, you guys are the first. And you want to make sure you get the first pub on it, right? So go ahead and get a letter out there. But that doesn't exclude you then for another six months later, writing the full story about it. The one that writes the full story will be the one that will have the most citations. And you Always. Wanna, yeah, and the key thing is to make sure that um, it truly is a full story. There's very little overlap. This is really a new yeah, yeah, paper. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. the thing point. people remember. That's a good point, Peter. Yeah. And take one more question on this before we move on. Um, kind of a continuation of that. If you were to make a structure and then, uh, and then that would be applied to something, would it, if it's a new structure, is it good to do a letter on, hey, I made this, or should you wait? I published a paper that says, look at what I made and what I did with it. Can you so repeat the question, though? Because we didn't get so it on the, my... The question was, if you make a new structure and then you apply it to something, and tell me if I get your question wrong, <laughs> uh, is that a, a good thing to write a letter on or, or not, basically? Um, more what I meant was, is, uh, my thought would be, you made, made a new structure published just the making of it because you haven't taken the time to apply it yet, but then maybe someone else will be using the application. So should you try and go on the territory by publish the making of the structure? So, so, that, that, so the question is, you make a structure, you think you have an application for it, do you publish the structure by itself or do you wait until you demonstrate the application? Yep. And the answer is, depends on the field, right? <laughs> And, and, and I mean it, I mean you have to, and, and I think in a sense that's where, that also makes a difference between whether you're publishing a letter or a, a full paper. If your whole field publishes letters, and some do, then if you want to wait and publish a full paper, I think it will be impact, impactful, but you may want to publish that letter first. In the case of the structure, I guess I would say in a research sense, if you think the structure gives away the application, and in some cases, that's certainly, certainly true, then I would probably demonstrate the application first. If you think that the structure is impactful in its own right and doesn't necessarily give away the application, I'd publish the structure. And you know, it's, it's your call as a researcher, but keep in mind that, it, as Gary said, you know, there's an expectation if you want tenure to get a certain number of papers, well, Maybe that's not true in the national lab, but there's also an expectation that you'll eventually bring in money. Yeah. And bringing in money correlates pretty strongly to your papers as well. And especially you want, if you want to try to establish a particular career path, then you really want to think about that. Um, then it becomes essentially a manpower issue, right? <laughs> how, much, how much people you have in the lab to actually get to the application. So Gary? Or whether you partner with somebody. Yeah. Let, let me just follow up with a, a simple comment though. If you have something that's really, really important and you publish that as a letter, remember that the same time you're working on that topic, there's anywhere between five, if it's a very small, tight area, to a couple of hundred people working exactly on that. So this means the minute you publish the letter slash communication, you better be prepared to work day and night to get the really full archival paper that follows on that. Yes, you, you gain the proper, you gain the territory with the first one, but you're going to make the impact with the full length papers. Right. So be prepared. But there's a big strategy you got to <laughs> figure out. You and your advisor, anybody who's working on the team, okay, are we ready for this, guys? Because if it's important with that first letter, wow, I'll tell you. 
people get so excited, people who are not working in your field will immediately turn to it. So you're not old enough, I know, but if you think about what happened in high TC superconductors, yeah. overnight we had three groups probably working on oxides to within two weeks, a thousand groups worldwide. It, it was like you could not believe. Yeah. And you know, graphene, I think, is another good example. Same thing happened. And, and this is what happens in our discipline. There are so many great researchers out there. It's full out competition. Yeah. Let, let me add something, last comment on this. A letter can be quite self-contained because you can also add supplemental information so this letter could be actually quite complete in every sense of the word. So you know, so you don't have to stress about um, finding an archival paper because you don't want to run the risk of appearing to be splitting hairs either. So that's the other side of the coin. I think I'll just I'll wrap this up. Is at the end of the day, and I think Dave, you said it uh, in the response. It really depends on the community. The soft matter community looks at this conundrum we're talking about different than the ceramics community, mm -hmm. different than the device community. And it's really knowing that community you're going after and how they do these things based on historic examples. You know the literature, you know the historic examples. That should be your guiding, uh, guiding star with regard to how to make those decisions, whether you do rapid communication followed by archival six months later, you pull it all together into a letter with supplemental that has a lot of the stuff. Um, or some other uh, coupling of, of different publication uh, avenues. So I want to thank all, everybody for those questions on the different types of publications, open access, how to make those decisions. Those are all uh, really important questions. Um, I'd like to move on for the, the, the last amount of time we have here is to navigating that peer review process. How do, how, how do you get that? idea published. And so that's what we'll have a panel discussion on, some of the topics like this, such as, you know, how do you write a cover letter? How do you recommend reviewers? Uh, what do you expect from the process? Um, how do you handle negative reviews? How do you respond to those? Uh, what timelines, things you want to expect? So to sort of start off this dialogue, uh, I'm just going to ask some of these questions and then We'll just open it up to, to anybody in the audience who has follow-up questions to, to, to jump in. So I think the, the first thing I want to ask Peter uh, is, you know, writing a cover letter. Yes. How, how do people right. do that? So the cover letter is very important. And uh, Gary alluded to this earlier. You have to decide in the end who is your readership going to be? What is your audience? First thing. This cover letter, um, the editor reads carefully. And um, you need to be careful to, be, to um, emphasize the, the, the rationale behind the work. Make sure you meet the criteria of the journal. It's very important. So in MRS communications, what we're looking for is essentially a description of why is this work important? What is this exciting result? And what are the potential implications, by and large? Um, these are very, very important things. I'd some, I, would sometimes read, I would typically read the abstract introduction and scan to the paper very carefully to make sure that what's actually in the letter is consistent with the cover letter. Editors, editors generally use cover letters to determine, to think about how they might go about as identifying reviewers. Um, they may sometimes re scan the paper and read the cover letter and decide that really it's not entirely appropriate for the journal. So I'd say the cover letter may be, more, may be just as important as the article itself with regard to how the editor-in-chief um, this, uh, identify the referees or, or the eventual outcome of the paper. Does anybody have any additional questions on writing the cover letter? I'd like to add one thing on it. Okay, go ahead. The, the editors do read the, your cover letter, and if, if it's a poorly written cover letter, meaning that you didn't even take the time to tell what was really important about your work, already the editor's thinking, this is not a careful author. Okay, so that's one thing. The second thing that often uh, journals are asking for in the cover letter is the ethics statement. And the ethics statement is about that you have not submitted your paper elsewhere, that you abide by ethics, and that all of the authors of your paper have read this paper. Okay, it's, it's not a joke. It's not something that, well, I'll just write it down, sure they did, but they didn't. Uh, you'd be surprised at how many times one of the other authors, they all get copied on the communications, 
says, I've never seen this paper. And again, it's, a, it's an ethics issue. So make sure that you do cover the ethics statement for your journal in that cover letter and abide by whatever they ask for, okay? So, um, in, in terms of format, <laughs> 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 we want um, a seat up here. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, we gave her all the questions when yeah, we wanted to ask. Um, so I, I was wondering, I guess, if you could elaborate a little bit more on the cover letter because I, I've been doing a ton of work and um, I've been meaning to publish for some time, but I always just go back in the lab and it's like, just one more experiment, just one more. Um, but in terms of the cover letter, I mean, like, what kind of, uh, I guess, formality should there be? Like, are there, do you put citations in the cover letter? Do you talk about just how cool your work is and how exciting it is? And I guess, last of all, like, how do you integrate the ethics statement into the cover letter? Like, because that seems kind of awkward. Like, just kind of putting it in there. I mean, how, how do you do that? Here, or Peter? Yeah, so the, the cover letter may vary whether or not you're writing it for a letters journal. And so if it's a letters journal, uh, you need to make sure that um, you, it's a novel result and it's impactful. If it's an archival journal, there is less stress to actually do that. The archival journal requires you to explain what's new and different about the work. So, this, so, so there, is a, there is a slight difference. Um, I think the ethics statements, um, often journals allow you to, uh, to deal with that separately. It, does, it doesn't have to be written in the cover letter. I never write it in the cover letter when I submit papers, by the way, if that's the, to, to, to answer your question directly. But I think that um, the cover letter really needs to communicate to the editor that you've read the journal criteria and you've actually, and the paper is actually written in such a way that it, it does meet its expectations. Dave, you want to Yeah, add? so I have sort of a more general comment. So, if you're going to submit to a particular journal, read the journal. Go and read papers in the journal. Get a sense for what those papers look like that have been accepted to the journal. When you write your cover letter, write to the kind of papers that are in the journal, right? So if it's a journal that is archival and talks about ceramic processing, then you better tell them why your paper is archival and talks about ceramic processing. If it's a letters journal and it's about electronic materials, same thing. Tell them why the result is new, why it deserves to be in that journal, and why the structure is such that it's appropriate to that journal. So, you know, when you write to advanced materials or nature materials or MRS communications, you won't write the same cover letter to all three. You'll write a specific cover letter to each journal that's different. I just just add to that. Um, use your colleagues, use your advisor, use your um, mentor network. Ask them for examples, and that's one of the best ways to learn. Um, there's no format. Um, of course, you have to be professional. <laughs> I don't think any of the editors want to have a letter that says, hey, how you doing? You know, look at our work. It's pretty good. So, you know, see attachment. You know, you have to be much more professional about that. Um, you know, first paragraph, make sure they clearly understand why what you are submitting, whether it's a letter or a review or, or what, and why you think it belongs in that journal. Um, if you want to uh, expand upon the, the great results, that may be the second paragraph. The, the third paragraph then is nice, polite recommendations of potential reviewers and why those reviewers would be good. And then the concluding paragraph, kind of thank, the, thank them for their time um, and uh, offer you know, yourself for answering any additional follow-up questions, just like you would any professional correspondence. But there is no template. Um, but as, as they all said, how you structure that general flow depends on the journal and what you're trying to communicate across. At the end of the day, that's your first impression to the editor. The editor reads that first. And so make a good impression. But use your, your mentor's network to find examples. Now, I, I did bring up one part of it, which was another thing up there, is, is how to recommend reviewers. Many uh, journals uh, ask uh, authors to, to recommend reviewers, and, and that's uh, a challenging thing. I remember when I first started publishing, um, you know, I thought, ooh, well, I'll just put all my friends down. <laughs> That'll guarantee. No, you don't want to do that. 
Uh, the community is small enough that the editors know when someone's trying to do that. Um, and so do you want to yeah, so, talk a little bit, Peter, right. about that? Yes, yeah, so I'll make one important comment. So Rich is pretty funny. There is a tendency for some grad students to do that. And um, you certainly want to recommend against it. A really good reviewer can actually improve the quality of a paper substantially. Um, they, can, they can help you to, they can identify potential pitfalls or errors in the paper because the last thing you need is to actually get a paper that's not properly refereed and there's some error that you, you know you're meant to have noticed. That's embarrassing. It's out there forever. Your grandkids will see it. <laughs> okay. So I think you want to identify um, reviewers who, um, who are experts in the field. It would be good to have read a number of the papers, the published papers, to get a sense. If you've read a paper written by somebody and you've actually learned a lot from those papers, that's actually a good person to recommend. Because you're looking for, in the end for a fair, fair evaluation and one that can be quite constructive. And my experience very often is that most papers, mo, mo, vast majority of papers are actually improved substantially after going through a refereeing process. Does that sound good, guys? Gary? Well, I'd like to add one more thing. Uh, the, the people, you have to think a little bit about who actually is going to review your paper. Just because you give three people that are good potential reviewers isn't necessarily that they will be assigned. And the reason that they may not be assigned is because you chose the three most famous people in your field. They're too busy, they will not review your paper if we ask them. They probably won't respond to the request. So think about the people that are really active in your field. Who, who are the mid-career people that are just, you see them coming to the meeting and you, you go, wow, that, you know, and you know them. Okay, the fact that you know them is all right. Okay, choose those people because they're the ones that are more likely to say, sure, I'd love to review that person's work. And like Peter says, not only will they like to review it, I mean, they'll be happy if you're successful and there's no errors, but like he says, a lot of times they'll find something that says, hey, by the way, maybe you could do this a little bit differently. Have you looked at this detail? And you will get a lot of value by choosing, therefore, good reviewers. Uh, so, so, again, put a little time into that. Don't go to the people who have the most citations in your field. They're, they're not likely to ever review your paper. Nothing against you, by the way. You have a couple questions here? Mm. Um, my question is, uh, you know, we can recommend reviewers, but then there's uh, what reviewers do you all actually send it to, and how do you choose which reviewers you send it to? Okay. That's, no, that, that's, that's a totally a, different that, that's story. That's a very good question. Us. Yes. Sometimes, sometimes we will choose a sub, subset of the reviewers that you recommend. And uh, the, oftentimes we'll choose reviewers that we happen to know um, are, know the field really well and are thoughtful and can be helpful. And so we, we will oftentimes, we'll often go to those reviewers as well. In the end, we like to publish a, a well-written paper with really new and exciting results. And that's in everybody's best interest, in your best interest and our best interest. So in the end, the referee choices are made to, uh, to basically get the best result. Yeah, I think your question and, and gets in the to, end, the... Um, to the key thing. I'll sometimes even I'll submit a paper and recommend referees I don't know, but I'm reading literature and I see that there's a person in um, X part of the globe who's written a number of papers in here, and so this, this guy, this, look, this is pretty good work. I'll recommend this person. I'm, I've, I've never been the least bit concerned about doing that. I think your question gets to the heart of these guys' job. I mean, the peer review process is meant to improve the paper, not wholesale reject things. And to do that, that's the process that manages yeah. it. So there's another part to your responsibilities as an author, and that is you have a responsibility to be a reviewer if asked. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, it's really critical. So you're right. You can recommend three people, and we can send letters to them, and they'll all go, no, I'm too busy, I'm on travel, whatever. Um, Finding good reviewers is a very, very difficult task for an editor nowadays. And so we all strive to get, to get reviewers that really will help the paper be better. Because our goal is to publish good papers, right? So if you get asked, please say yes. Don't, don't go, eh. It's a really key part of the way the whole process has to work cyclically that you review as well as you write. Yes, and, I, uh, and, and the key thing too is that and we're asking because we value your opinion. And um, the key thing is 
make sure that you're really constructive. Be always very polite. Assume that um, your review is going to be published on a billboard someplace for everybody to see. And if you're going to be embarrassed by, by looking at it, don't write a review like that. <laughs> That's a general thing. <laughs> Is there any other questions on recommending reviewers? Um, what if they're the lab that's competing with you on like, coming up with the next thing, and they're like, super close to what you're doing? Is that, is that a concern or not? Well, look, you know that. Dave, can you repeat the question? What, what, if it's a, what if the suggested reviewers are in a lab that's competing with you and about to come up with the same thing? I, I guess I would say tough. No, <laughs> no, no, I mean, really, the, the reality is when you submit a paper, it's a public disclosure, effectively. And if you're really worried about not getting the information out there, I mean, this happened in the high TC stuff. People would literally get on an airplane and fly to the editorial offices and hand them the paper and say, Review it in house. That's how old Dave is. That's how old Dave is. <laughs> was in that community too. So, but but you know, if you have something that's that competitive, make sure it's a complete set of work. Yeah. What they're going to do is they're going to go by the submitted date. And you know, if you submitted it and it got accepted, and they submitted it subsequently, you win. Yeah. So should, you, should you include them as a recommended reviewer? I'd like to answer that question. Dave, Dave makes a series, made a series of very important points. If you are so concerned, you could just indicate to the editor that you believe that per person X has a serious conflict of interest and you would prefer that they not ask person X to be a referee. You could do that. Just in the same way, if someone's about to referee your paper and they have a major conflict of interest, they should disclose that very quickly. So if they're, if they're I, I'm new to the world yeah. that have been published before. So is that a significant concern or because they know so much about the field, should you recommend them as a reviewer? First off, you want to find... But can you can repeat the question? I'm sorry. You get to repeat yeah, this yeah, yeah, question. Right, 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 right. <laughs> I'm sorry. You, 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 so you've asked a question that we've answered earlier, essentially, that um, you know, to what extent do you, do you recommend somebody who could be a competitor, what have you? The reality is that everybody working in the field you're working in is a competitor. And so you just want to ensure that you find someone who's thoughtful and someone who knows the area well that can actually provide really good feedback. So you. I will tell you one thing. If you have the courage to suggest your competitors and they come back with a positive review, it's a guarantee you'll get the paper published. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, listen, I think and, the vast majority of reviewers, at least my experience, are quite constructive. And, and a lot of times a reviewer will tell you they have a conflict of interest. Yeah. One other question here in the back. So I thought it was really interesting that a lot of scientists spend a lot of time trying to up how many times they get cited and they get published, but you were saying it's a give and take and being a reviewer is just as important. Is there such thing as a review impact, like how many times you've been asked to review something in addition to how many times you've published something? Because no. it seems like that would give people a logical yeah. incentive to review. So <laughs> the editor, so here's what happened. Journals will sometimes write you a letter saying thank you. You know, you, you, you're one of the most important reviewers that year. Physical Review Letters actually um, gives an award to, um, to outstanding referees and um, it's, it's a high honor very much as if an APS fellow can have a high honor, which is published um, yearly. So that's, I think some of the journals may start doing that in the future. So I have a slightly more, I don't know whether it's cynical or realistic viewpoint. I mean, we do know who reviews well. We do know who sends back reviews. Um, very often those people are thought of positively um, I think it's good for your career to review. Uh, when you go for that tenure decision, if you've been an active rev reviewer for, you know, nature and science and our journals, they're all semi-equivalent, um, <laughs> then that actually can help. Uh, I, I think that it's just part of the, the process. But what I did find is over the long haul, People who review well then get asked to be on funding boards, and then they get asked to be on other things where you review, and then you become more intimately involved in the whole process. And I think that actually is an important part of your career. That is correct. Yeah, there's, there's probably not metrics, but it's a very important part of 
being an active member of our profession. And uh, that's part of your reputation. It gets around and good things happen when you have a good reputation. And so it is very important to provide reviews that are constructive, just like you would like to receive constructive reviews. I have one more question. Um, do the editors themselves actually read the papers and sort of come up with their own, uh, I guess, review? And you know, does that play a part in the whole decision process? Yes. I mean, you said that you 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 uh, you know you read the cover letter very you know deeply, but then what about think, the actual? I don't think that mic is yeah. Right. Oh, that thing. No, I I read the cover letter and I actually go through the paper very quickly to get a sense of it, to get a sense of uh, the entire paper before actually identifying which editor the paper should actually go to. So those of you that submit to Science and Nature will know that the editors actually have the power of rejection. They read the paper initially and decide whether it will ever be reviewed. Well, that's true of MRS communications. It, I mean, yes. it's true of yes, all journals right. at some level. Yeah, but, but yeah, I'll you actually... Know, I, think, I think that's a journal's, that's part of our job, mm -hmm. is to actually appreciate the work well enough to know whether it fits whether it's good enough and it's worth the review process. Yeah, because we are about to send it to people who are very busy. And the last thing we need to do is to send a paper that's really not going to get um, accepted to reviewers out there because you've just wasted the time. And the next time they see a paper coming from you, they're going to want it. Do I really want to pay attention to these guys again? So it's, it's, it's an it's a interesting um, process. So when you get the little email that says it's been sent out for review, that means it's already been reviewed at least once. So I, this is a good, I guess, cavi or uh, entree into next part. Um, and I think what 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 happens during the review process? And I guess maybe Gary, do you want to share from an editor's viewpoint uh, what happens from the other side? Yeah. So actually, it, it touched on a lot of what happens with your paper once once it gets out there. Uh, but what can you expect out of this process? First of all, I think uh, it's pretty obvious that it's going to be reviewed by an expert in your field. This won't be somebody who is t just tangentially related to your field. It will be somebody who knows what you're doing in great detail, maybe more than you do. But that's all right, because those are going to be people that can find you know, the quality of your work and the significance and like that. Um, you should expect a very fair assessment of the quality of your work. Now, as an expert and a person who owns your research, that's a phrase I use with my students, you have to own your research, you're the owner. You should already know before it goes out there, how is this going to be handled? Because you're going to send it to people who are your competitors. I mean, granted, we're all competitors in the end, right? Because we're going to hunt for research funding, we want to make the best advances, etc. But they're going to come back and they're going to give a very conscientious assessment of the quality of your work. And what they're then going to do is they're going to send back, the review will come back to you with, well, sometimes you don't like the tone of the review, but part of the review might be that, by the way, if you did the following kinds of things, you could really improve your paper. You know, these are the constructive criticisms, and that's what you're looking for, the constructive reviewer says, oh, by the way, the example I gave of the figures earlier, you know, as a reviewer, I would have said, why don't you eliminate these figures in your, in your resubmission? They're not necessary. The real information is the other one. Emphasize that. And I, you know, a very simple statement. Now, as a reviewer, or as, a, as the author, you have to then think about, what do I do with this constructive criticism? I mean, you have to think about your response. But expect you, as an author, should expect from the review process professionalism and constructive feedback. If there's an, any mention of you know, negativity in that letter, uh, uh, just tension in that letter that, you know, uh, that, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable, you know, that's not appropriate. And we, we always try to make sure that those types of letters and types of reviews don't get through the system. Okay, so sometimes if you're writing, and think about yourself, if you're writing the review yourself, yeah, don't say this is the most idiotic idea I've ever seen. Don't ever write that. Don't ever write it, because your review will never get sent on. But even more importantly, um, as I mentioned earlier, when you write the review, pretend it's in a billboard somewhere. If you're going to be embarrassed, yeah. don't write it. That's the thing to bear in mind. 
It's a statement about you uh, as an individual when you write reviews that are, that are really meant to be uh, sort of mean and unkind. But at the same time, if you're in the receiving end of it, um, look at it very carefully and decide, because usually there's something about the paper that somebody may not have understood or, or may have come across the wrong way. And so every review, no matter what it is, just assume that this person took the time to read your paper and provide comments and decide in the end um, where you're going to modify it and how you're going to change it to ensure that um, you don't run a risk of miscommunicating with a million readers once it's out there. And I think that may be the most important thing. And when you respond to reviewers, um, even if it's unkind, do not respond in kind. Be very polite. So again, No matter what you're thinking, always remain polite and cordial. <laughs> so that's what I was, I was Dave, I think we, we talked a little bit. Um, what, along this idea of being polite, uh, what do you expect when you see the letter coming back from the author with regard to the responses to the editor or to the reviewer's comments? How do you look at that and how do you so, read into that? Yeah. So I think, first of all, you all have an emotional attachment to your, to your submission. And if you didn't, I'd be highly surprised. None of us are, are, are that altruistic. Um, so when you get the comments back, your first response is, hell no. Your second is, oh, that's, that's all garbage. So my recommendation is read it, set it aside, wait a couple hours, or, or read it, or, or, a days, day, or, days, or a day, or days. Or days. Usually a day or two. If you're trying to get a letter in, <laughs> and then read it again, and try to appreciate what the reviewers are really saying. And take notes. Go through the, what you get and write down what they're really saying. Because usually, hopefully, there's three reviews. Hopefully, the, the minimum is hopefully there's at least two. But they just, you know, they, they may not say the same thing. In fact, it's highly unlikely they'll say exactly the same thing. So extract what's important. Then look at those items and see what can you fix. I mean, what's an easy fix? Where did you just forget to put the right, you know, units on a figure? Or can you fix the figure and put more information? I agree with Gary. Figures are uh, way undervalued. Um, what can't you fix? What is not beyond your scope? So you're a graduate student. You just finished your defense. You're writing this up at home with your mom. And <laughs> you realize that you need to go back and use the equipment that you no longer have access to to finish something. Either you have to find a collaborator to do that, or you have to just be honest and say, I can't do that experiment. And sometimes you have to say that. You always have to face the fact we're none of us are so smart that we don't occasionally write a paper that has a fatal flaw. If the fatal flaw is identified, that's great, right? Before it gets into publication and everybody goes, well, that's kind of dumb. You have a fatal flaw in your paper. Think about how you fix it, how far you have to backtrack to get it fixed. It's, you know, this happens to everybody. I've had lots of papers that come back with something that says, you've got to do more experiments. You, you haven't completely mapped what you're trying to say. Then build a response, and you have to actually build two responses. Just like we've talked about in submitting a paper, where you need a cover letter and you need the paper, you also need a cover letter to the editor which says, I humbly have addressed all the comments of all the reviewers, even the idiot who, no. And, <laughs> and, and, you, and you go point by point and say, this reviewer said this, 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 and this. This is why it's so important to extract those points to start with. And I addressed it by changing these sentences, by changing this paragraph. I added a figure. I subtracted the three figures that nobody liked, et cetera. And overall, we've improved the paper as you've indicated, and we think it's now ready for, for publication. And at the same time, you have to resubmit the manuscript, and I highly recommend that you highlight the changes you make and you show where the changes are so that if it does get sent back out to the reviewers, and depending on the, the circumstances, it very well might, they can easily see that you actually read their letter you read their review and you actually made substantial changes to accommodate that, which most reviewers feel really pretty good about because they want to be involved in that improvement of the manuscript and actually seeing it come back and being done is 
is very good. So you have to do the, the, the letter to the editor, you have to do the manuscript, and I think you, know, you have to think overall that you kind of have to put personal pride aside for a while when you do this and really think about how to make the manuscript the best that it can be and how to make it publishable. And then once you resubmit it and it gets accepted, then you'll feel really good about it. I think uh, I, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to add, um, I think it's also very important to discuss the reviews with some of your co-authors. Like, for example, I, I discuss reviews with all my graduate students who are involved in that particular paper. Because sometimes reviews come back and you're not sure what, this, what the referee is particularly trying to say. And you have to think very carefully about the question and what you've done to be sure that you answer the right thing. Because the last thing you need to do is send responses that aren't particularly relevant to what the referee is asking. It, looks, it gets a little ugly after that. Yeah. <laughs> I might also add that you can disagree with the review. Yeah. You feel free to disagree. Some parts are correct. You've addressed them. But there are some comments in here that you feel that the reviewers are uninformed, that they've made a mistake, and here's your response to that. Don't assume, just because three people wrote a review, and one of them pointed out something that it's necessarily they got it right. Yeah. Sometimes they get it wrong. Don't and use just, words. And just yeah. let them know. Don't yeah. use words like the referee's uninformed, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll just yeah add to that. That letter back when you write it, assume those referees are going to read it. Oh, they will. They so, will. Yeah. And do not will. write those types of things. And if you say you disagree, disagree politely and justify why you disagree. But don't, don't forget, there's a letter back to the editor. And the uh, letter back to the editor, you can address it this way. This is not for the, for the reviewers. And you'd like to bring up the point that you feel that review number two is completely misplaced. This, this group is obviously not attuned to what's going on in the field. And sometimes it happens. Yeah, but you make sure you're 100% right. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's your field, right? But, 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 but sometimes these are gray areas. You yeah, know? But, but Gary's something. right. It, don't, don't be afraid to say, you know, all these comments are correct. We changed the manuscript, but this comment is just not yeah. correct, and oh, this yeah. is why. Right. No, that's right? absolutely I mean, right. But the comment, if you're going to write something private to the editor, make sure that you're totally, there's no gray <laughs> area about this, because these things will backfire. Yeah. So is there any questions on this part of the process? No? Um, so I, I have uh, two, two questions. Um, so I guess the first is, are there any journals or any circumstances under which uh, it would warrant a blind or double blind review? And then um, my second question is, in terms of paper submissions, whether they be letters or uh, full articles, um, is it in the review process where it's decided that, okay, these figures are going to be put in the supplemental information section, or do you submit a paper or a manuscript with the supplemental figures already included? How does that work? Okay. When you, I mean, the paper, as Gary described it, right, you need to be sure that it has all the relevant information that actually uh, makes a case. The conclusions really are supported by all the information that you have there. The supplemental section, supplementary section really includes additional data that you, wouldn't, that you didn't want to include in the paper or, it, or that it helps to make the case. So it's really the submission where you actually decide, when you actually write in the paper, that you decide what, what's supplementary and what really needs to be front and center in the journal. So an example would be if you're publishing a journal article about a functionality of a particular material and its crystal structure is important and new, you can have the, the crystal structure in there, but your supplemental information can be the whole refelt refinement, which is you know tables and tables of yeah, data. Yeah, yeah. yeah, good point. Good example. We're coming close to the end. This has been a really great dialogue. Hopefully, uh, everybody has has gotten something uh, from from the from the session. Uh, I just want to conclude uh, uh, before before we all part with one last, I guess, question, which is we've talked about everything from how to choose the journal, different types of journals, and the process. Um, and I just want to give Gary a chance to talk about what time frame you should expect. What is a quality journal, what type of battle rhythm um, would you expect from a, from, from a journal and your paper submission and, and response for the reviews, et cetera? Well, first of all, it kind of depends upon whether it's a letter journal or whether it's a full-length paper uh, journal. 
uh, typically within the first week. Sometimes as much as two weeks, your paper is assigned to be reviewed. Uh, that means that the paper is then distributed out to reviewers to be looked at. Typically would give them about a month uh, for a full length. In some of the letters journals, it's two weeks. And the editors in those cases are constantly beating on, on the reviewers. I want your review now. And if you don't get it that day, they'll tell you the next day, I want it now. So you might know a couple of those journals. Uh, maybe Peter's journals like that, I don't know. Uh, but uh, within a month, you should expect a review back. Sometimes it goes a couple of months. You have to ask yourself, well, why is it taking so long? Poorly written paper takes longer to review. No one wants to sit down and work on trying to review in a constructive way a poorly written paper. So if the quality of the paper is low, it takes longer to get it reviewed. That's the reality. The better it's written, the quicker it will go through the review process because it's a delight to read your paper. So consider a month, maybe two months. Uh, it then goes back to you with this wonderful review and you can look at it and read it. It's up to you how fast you get it back, but most journals say get it back within one month or you're kicked out of the queue. Uh, and, and then they, you say, well, I can't get it done in a month. And so you write to the editor and say, can I have another week? And normally they'll say, okay, another week. But if you take three months, forget about it. And the reason is it's just a traffic flow problem, handling all these papers that are not in, in, the, in the mainstream. So it's up to you to get the paper back in. That will accelerate the process. If you've responded, as we've just talked about, with you know, uh, recognize what the things are, this is how you addressed it. Like Dave suggested, you highlight the things that you correct in your paper. Make sure you do that. It's so much easier for your reviewer to then sit down, look at it, and within a half an hour, they've got to figure out, yeah, they addressed it. Great, publish this dang thing. Or, hey, there's one little more minor thing. But we're talking about in the press, in a, in a normal process, within about four months, you've got it already accepted. Depends on you too, by the way. Don't forget, you have to get it back in. Okay, and then in a matter of a couple of months, it's online, it's out there. So today, a typical standard is in six months, your stuff is published online. Uh, depending upon how they're publishing, you can even have the journal, the, the formal journal identified. Uh, not too much distance after that as well, because it's all digital these days. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we'll just repeat the question. Yes. <laughs> so, go ahead. That's a great so the question. The question was yeah, they submitted a textbook chapter on time, and the book is still not out. Um, so, I don't want to discourage you not to submit the chapter on time, but having put together a number of books, uh, those are the hardest things to put together in a timely way. And it is, there's a lot, you know, the, you want good people to write the articles and the chapters, they have their own time scales. Getting everybody to do it on the right time scale is extremely difficult. And so my guess is that there's somewhere an editor tearing his hair out, trying to get all the chapters together, um, and eventually the, the book will come out. But it's very difficult. It's a real challenge for the editor to get all the articles in on time. I think, oh, go I'd ahead. like to just Here. make one comment, though. You know, when you put a lot of effort into writing a paper, a book chapter, uh, when you submit it, we owe it to you to return it to you in, in due course, in, in a timely fashion. If we do not, okay, start sending messages. Yeah. To the point that if you do not get a response, withdraw your paper and let your friends know that you had to withdraw your paper from that journal. And let the journal know that that's what you're going to do. And they won't do it too many more times after that. So, you know, it's hard reality. Sometimes, like Dave says, 
uh, boy, it's, it's difficult. But if that, uh, that editor is not corresponding with you, why that paper's delayed? If they're not corresponding with you, then, hey, knock on the door. Say, come on. I gave you my paper. I expect a review back. If you're not going to review it, let me know so I can yeah. take it elsewhere. So it's, it's a two-way street here. Yeah, and I think that it's a great sum summary. And uh, I think all of us up here are very passionate about the, the, the future researchers in materials understanding the peer review process, understanding how to publish. We have a lot of classes in school, and it's very rare anybody ever sits down and teaches us this process and how to do it. You're just assumed to know and assume that somehow you figure it out. Um, so hopefully this has started your journey, give you some answers to some of those questions, but don't think this is it. It's a dialogue back and forth like all communication. If you guys have other questions, feel free to ask. I mean, it's within your right. The journals are here to publish your stuff, so ask. You find the editors around the meetings, pull them aside, ask them questions, ask myself questions. Um, you know, we got the publication booth upstairs uh, outside of the exhibit. Cambridge has their booth uh, inside. Stop by, ask more questions. The best is about having the dialogue and getting your questions answered. So please feel free to do that. Uh, we're, we're here to help, not to, not to jump down your throat. There's never a dumb question when it comes to publications. Uh, we'll, we're, we're here to make sure the best publications come out and reflect well on yourself as well as where you're publishing it. So with that as a summary, I want to thank you guys very much for spending your Sunday evening with us. Uh, most importantly, I want to uh, thank the editors of the MRS Journals. And again, I remind you, if, if you have any things you'd like to review on this, uh, this session will be up on the uh, MRS On Demand site. You're free to go back and, and look at it and review things. And again, thank you guys very much. Have a great evening. <laughs>